Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And I'm very pleased today to welcome to the programme Laura Maxwell, who is a spiritual counsellor and founder of the Christian ministry Our Spiritual Quest, which is based in Scotland, though it has a global reach. Many years ago, Laura and her mother were involved in spiritualism, during which time they were taught that Lucifer is God. But now committed to Jesus Christ, Laura ministers to people who are involved in, or who have been involved in, the occult, the New Age, and various other new religious movements. And her work now appears worldwide via satellite TV, radio, books, magazines, and online. And indeed, she hosts her own show on Eternal Radio, interviewing ex-occultists about their own Christian conversion stories and their outreach to people who are still involved in that kind of scene. So, Laura, thanks very much indeed for joining us on The Mind Renewed. Hello, Julian, and thank you very much for asking me on. It's good to be speaking with you. Now, I first heard of you and your ministry via Vince McCann, who's been on this program a couple of times, and he shared his dramatic testimony on one of those times that he was with us. You know Vince quite well, don't you? Yeah, Vince is a good friend, and he does some really good articles and videos on YouTube. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I guess that uh, many of the things that he says about his previous involvement in the occult connects with your own experience as well. Yeah, I could identify with a lot of what he shared. Mm -hmm. And um, you're speaking to us from Scotland because your your ministry is based there. Whereabouts in Scotland are you? Uh, Not that far from Glasgow, actually, so quite central. Yeah. What's it like living up there? Is it uh, cold most of the time? Do you ever see the sun? (laughs) It's cold and raining right now, yeah, Yeah, but we've had some sunny days lately, so. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's good to be speaking with you. Now, we're going to be uh, talking about your life today, your life story, your experience of once having been involved in spiritualism, along with your mother. Now, that's a term that seems really quite vague to me, Um, so I'll be asking quite what that term means in your own experience as we go along. What does spiritualism mean? Um, And of course, I'll be asking about your coming to faith in Christ and the ministry that you now have. So um, I normally ask guests for a, a bit of background information before we get onto the subject under discussion but of course your life is the subject under discussion so we'll get straight into it Uh, now you were brought up at least for part of your childhood in this spiritualist context so could you tell us how did that all begin for you that life in that scene yeah basically as a young child i was interested in the supernatural phenomena i was interested in watching children's tv programs you know, about ghost stories or aliens, just anything that was unexplainable and mysterious. I suppose if the book Harry Potter had been out then, I'd probably would have loved that. It was anything really um, supernatural. And also, I did have a few psychic experiences as a child, so that piqued my interest. Hmm. What sort of thing did you experience as a child? Um having premonitions or dreams about things that would take place and they would take place and they would be very accurate. You know, it might be whether it's meeting someone in a certain area and having a certain conversation with them or it might be something that then happened later broadcast on the news. Mm. Um, And my mother had been the same since her childhood but she didn't really explore it. She just didn't have time or didn't bother to get into it. Mm. So it wasn't until later on when I was around about a pre-teen age By then, my parents divorced and she felt more able to explore it because my dad hadn't um, really approved of anything like that. So because of this, she began to read more books on contacting spirits, whether that be spirits that claim to be ghosts of dead relatives or whether it claimed to be these entities that said they were ascended masters or different kinds of gods, anything like that, the kind of a whole supernatural arena she was really interested in. Mm. When you were having these early experiences, uh, psychic experiences that you've described, did that just come out of the blue or was there an influence of this kind of thing in your family already? Well, Our immediate family weren't involved, you know, my mother's parents weren't, but it was in the family line, it did run down the generations and we did have at that time one of my mother's uncles and a couple of cousins were very much into spiritualism. In fact, we had an uncle who 
was the president of a spiritualist church in Ayrshire, and he was also in the Freemasons. So, and I think we did have a few conversations with him when I was younger, and he obviously encouraged my mother as well. And you say she divorced. Presumably that drove her back more and more into this interest that she already had. But am I right in thinking that there was some encounter that she had as well? Mm -hmm. I'm getting this from one of the interviews you did uh, where somebody approached her and said that she was particularly gifted or something like that. Yeah, she was just walking the dogs in the local park one day and a gentleman approached her. He was a psychic medium. They'd never met before, but he could sense that she did have these psychic abilities so much so that he actually asked her if she wanted to come to the spiritualist church in Glasgow and learn how to develop these abilities and how to channel spirits and so on. So of course she was delighted and took his offer and started to go. What sort of... And I started to go too. Yeah, yeah. What sort of age were you at this time? I think it must have been around about second year or third year at school, so about... 13, 14, I think. Right, quite an impressionable age indeed. Yep. So you got involved in this, Mm -hmm. it was actually called a spiritualist church, is that right? Yeah, it's still there actually, yeah. It's called a spiritualist church. And basically it looks, you know, just like a church. They do have Sunday services, they have midweek services, but it's not Christian. They'll give a sermon, if you like, that's full of, you know, good moral teaching, as it were, and very interesting and then they will um, at the end give what they call a demonstration and that's where the medium on the platform will go into trance and communicate with these spirits and often give messages to those in the congregation you know claiming to be the dead relatives are coming through and making contact and of course it's all always um, very accurate Um, I wouldn't say it's any charlatan work going on we always found it extremely accurate so that's what they would do on a Sunday the midweek meetings would involve things like psychic development groups yoga classes and meditation things that were very much encouraged to do because they firmly believe practicing yoga and meditation opens you to the spirit realm in fact you know the actual yogis themselves Hindus and Buddhists who obviously started with yoga before it became mainstream, they will even say yoga is designed to attune you to spirit realm. It's not just a healthy exercise. So, yeah, we were encouraged to do things like that. You're actually encouraged to contact your own personal spirit guide, is that right? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Is that the main, I mean, from the standard Christian point of view, we're encouraged, of course, to have a relationship with with Jesus and with with God. Um, But here, I get the impression that you're more encouraged to have this relationship with a particular Mm -hmm. guide, a spirit guide. Was there a sense of God as well in that picture? Well, it was more a case of, you know, sometimes they, they even felt that they were channeling Jesus Christ and that he was a guide or an ascended master, that he wasn't the the saviour, as the Bible describes. He was just one of many saviour-type figures down through the ages. Mm. If you know about the zeitgeist movement, they will say, for example, that that Jesus Christ was just a reincarnated saviour of one of the previous so-called saviours, and they give a list of them, Mm. so they feel there's nothing special about him, really. Mm. So their idea of God... It was New Age spiritualism that that I was a part of, so there are different types of spiritualism, um, although they all do involve contacting spirits, channeling spirits, that's the key thing they have in common. Mm. But the New Age type is more more popular, we see today, um, and really involves a notion of a kind of a universal consciousness that, that the universe itself is God, as it were, and that each of us can tap into these energies of the universe and that each of us has God inside us, that each of us can be as a God, as it were, and that we all just need to evolve spiritually to attain that oneness where we will all become one and we will all be linked. So an idea of a personal God like Jesus Christ, no. Um, But also it's kind of hard to explain. It's like no and yes, because they also feel like all the different gods, all the different religions, everything in the world like that, all the spiritualities 
really that is that person's truth. So if you believe in Buddha, that's your truth. If you believe in Hindu gods, that's your truth. If you believe in Jesus, that's your truth. But collectively, all of that really is one and the same God, and that happens to be Lucifer. Right. So this connects to the Luciferianism that you were taught and mm -hmm. theosophical writings that you read and the Lucis Trust, which you talked to yeah. me a little bit before the interview began. I will be asking you about that in a little bit. Um, I'm getting the impression also that the Bible wouldn't really be reckoned as, well, certainly not authoritative. Was it used at all in your services? It was used. Um, they used various religious books. And again, they felt that as in any type of religion, any kind of a spiritual teaching, they just felt there's truth in all of these things. Uh, and basically, you yeah. can take from it what, what you believe and you can dump what you don't believe. So sometimes the Bible was read. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting the, <laughs> the picture here. Um, was any reference made to the famous Fox sisters, in your experience, those are the Fox sisters um, who were the late 19th century in New York. They're very influential, weren't they? Yeah, we were aware of them, and I, rem I remember reading about them in certain books and papers in the the library in the Spiritualist Church. Um, but we didn't really put too much emphasis on them. Um, we were more interested in Madame Blavatsky and other mm. quite famous mediums. Yeah, maybe there was a desire to keep quiet about them because I understand that they admitted to fraud towards the end of their lives, but uh, perhaps it's best for people in the spiritualist movement not to mention that fact. Um, so you were involved with all kinds of things like uh, seances, presumably, and astral projection and things like that? Uh, seances, yes. I didn't get into astral projection myself. My mother did. Uh -huh. I tried it, but I wasn't quite there yet. I was young, so I wasn't dedicating a lot of my time to it, <laughs> yeah. although I did plan to get into it more later. Yeah, that and things like crystal healing, any kind of alternative therapies where it was healing from any type of supernatural sources. For example, if I had been doing it today, I'm pretty sure I would be very into Reiki and the likes we were very interested in reincarnation and hearing people's accounts of past life regression experiences. So we just really believed that this was all very good and, and that, as I say, there was nothing dangerous about it. We felt that Lucifer was God and Christians were wrong about him. He did not fall and become Satan um, and that he was actually still the angel of light. It all seemed very exciting. It seemed wonderful, the teaching that they would give. Obviously, that um, in the latter days, more and more of society would get into this type of thing and um, they would fall away from old fuddy-duddy religions. They would open up, they would go to yoga classes, meditation classes, they would start to channel spirits, they would all become spiritual and really help to bring peace and unity to the whole world and it would be a new dawn, as it were. So it all seemed very beautiful, actually. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about this uh, Luciferianism. Now, this connects with historic Gnosticism, but there are different ways of thinking about Luciferianism, and indeed, of course, people often think of Luciferianism as the same as Satanism, but it's not the same, is it? Um, could you give us some idea about the difference between Luciferianism and what people normally mean when they talk about Satanism? Interestingly, there are different branches of it. Um, I would say that, for example, the type of spiritualism that my mother and I were involved in is probably the most mainstream type, the new age type and it's it's a belief that Lucifer is still the angel of light that he's really the good guy and so we would not have in any way, shape or form identified with any type of Satanism or harming people or anything like that or black magic, we were not into that mm. um, and there are those types of Luciferianism where the boundaries are very blurred, a bit like yin and yang idea. They see that Lucifer is good and bad at the same time. The kind of notion of, you know, it's okay if you do white magic as opposed to black magic. Magic is okay, it just depends on what you use it for, that type of idea. And then, of course, there are those who are more advanced in the darkness of it all and they will actually identify with Satanism and Lucifer as being Satan although they may still call him just Lucifer. And of course, there's different branches of Satanism too. It's not fair to say they're all people that are into doing a sacrifices and all that, because a lot of them don't even believe Satan is an entity. So there's variations in that as well. 
Yes, it's quite a complex tapestry, isn't it, to uh, mm -hmm. pick apart. Um, yeah, so as you say, there is this very famous Church of Satan, isn't there, which the guy called Anton LaVey set up in the 1960s. And as far as I understand, they don't actually believe that Satan exists as a spiritual being, but he's sort of a symbol of uh, self-indulgence and, uh, mm -hmm. and defiance, that kind of thing. I believe he wrote the, uh, the Satanic Bible with that quote, do what thou wilt, that is the whole of the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> horrible, horrible statement. But that kind of sums up mm -hmm. that sort of scene, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I've known people who have been into that. And in actual fact, if you met them, you wouldn't in any way think they were an evil person. I met a young lady, she was just 16, into all of that, and she read that Bible and she was a lovely girl, I have to say. There was nothing evil about her at all. Yeah, folks just don't often realise the roots and the real spirituality behind a lot of these teachings. And yet, as you say, there is the what you might call the theistic side of things, where people do actually believe that Satan is a spiritual being and revere him and um, mm -hmm. look into magic and all that sort of thing. So there is the other side. As you say, with Luciferianism, there are these different flavours as well. So there's, I understand there is a kind of... Um, a rationalistic version of that, where Lucifer is just a symbol, you know, inner truth, self-development, liberation, that sort of thing. But that's that's not where you were at, was it? You, mm -hmm. Yours was more sort of pantheistic, so Lucifer was this guiding spirit, the kind of top spirit, is that right? The top expression of the pantheistic reality, as far as you understood. Is, is that it? Yeah. We believed the famous medium's explanation of him, um, Barbara Max Hubbard. Um, she's still around today and she still talks about it as well. Really, that Lucifer is the god, as it were, that he descended from. I think it was Venus and um, it was him who made the ultimate sacrifice to come here. And we didn't talk to Lucifer or pray to him or anything like that. As you say, we were far more interested in communicating with spirits, whether they be so-called ghosts or spirit guys. We were just aware that Lucifer was at the top of it, and we kind of ignored him, really. Mm. Um, and we were more interested in seances or ghost hunts and so on. Yeah. So you say that, uh, I'm just trying to get a, some sort of picture of <laughs> the theological landscape here with this. Um, so you say that Lucifer was considered the one who'd come to the world to bring knowledge, salvation in that sort of Gnostic sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So Jesus presumably would have been one expression of that. Um, mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that's sort of flipping Judeo-Christianity on its head, isn't it? Yeah, Jesus is just one of many, really. And basically, he's really not that important, they would say. He was in the age of Pisces, and we are now in the age of Aquarius, which we are all much more spiritually evolved than that. That was their way of thinking, and that Christians were amongst a group of people who were very spiritually dull and very low on the evolutionary spiritual ladder, as it were, and that Christians were, in actual fact, holding up this age of light and utopia because the Christians still thought Lucifer was Satan, so they were... They were against things like, you know, yoga, meditation, spirit communication, and really they were blocking some of Lucifer's light. And essentially that, in order for the world to reach this place of global peace and unity and harmony with our space brothers or our spirit guides, the Christians would have to leave the planet, um, whether by, you know, aliens would take them away or very much this sense of all of the Christians will be faced to have a choice, take the Luciferian pledge or die. People like Barbara Max Hubbard have even said that. You know, it, it's in books, it's, it's out there, so it's not just me saying this. It can be checked out. Well, as it happens, Dr Stanley Monteith, who was on this show a few years ago, said that he had read a book by Barbara Marx Hubbard. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was the book of co-creation, and he said he had an original copy of it and that she had written something along the lines that you just described there, but uh, that in later editions that portion of the text was excluded. So, I mean, I can't oh, really? oh, verify that yeah. myself, but that's what he said. So that connects mm -hmm. with what you've said there. Yes, basically, in, in the original text of her book, why she basically talks about how there is a quarter of the people who certainly will go along with the world government, and that's great. About half the people in the world really won't go along. They'll just sort of drift in and do whatever they're told. But there's a quarter of the world who will object to what's going on today and will try to fight it 
and they are going to have to be destroyed. They're going to have to be killed. And then he goes on to say, but that is not your job, my dear. That is ours, for we are the riders of the pale horse, death. Those are exact words. I have a copy of the original original manuscript. Now, when she published the book, why she took that out, um, the original book, of course, I have a copy of when it was published for general consumption. They took that part out. They really don't want the public to realize they intend to kill off a large segment of the population of the world. Her words were, that is not your job, referring to killing the quarter of the population who will go along, and that's the Christians, of course. Uh, that is our job, my dear, for we are the riders of the pale horse, death. And you'll find that quotation in my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. Um, did you get any of that kind of attitude from the Lucis Trust? Because you were reading a lot of information from that organization, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and even from mediums and psychics that we knew who weren't involved in the, the Lucis Trust, they were just local, you know, mediums and spiritualists. Mm. But they knew of all this teaching too. And very much it was a case of we believed in reincarnation, we believed in karma, and I remember initially when I heard that certain religious groups would have to be killed, the main group was Christian, although it wasn't the only group, but I remember at first thinking, oh man, that's terrible, but we were told, you know, don't feel sorry for them, it's okay, they have to be removed, and they can be reincarnated, they can come back, and they can join with us next time, so, you know, it's not as if they're their existence is completely over, that, you know, they may right. evolve and do better next time and it's necessary for the planet that they are removed. And so all of these kind of teachings would have a rationale behind them that would seem to be sensible and um, would seem to make sense. So, yeah, I did believe that. I suppose the thing that confuses me about this is whether that's understood in an active sense or in a passive sense. What I mean is, uh -huh. did they believe that this had a sort of prophetic force to it, that as what they believed was the truth would gradually swallow up the whole world, according to their hope, mm -hmm. that things would just work out that way, that Christians would either go along with it or they would just they would just die out or things would, would just happen? Or was it a case of actually looking forward to a time when some kind of action would be taken to remove people? Were they actually saying that? Well, both in actual fact, because in these various movements that I've discussed and certain witchcraft groups too, we basically felt that down through the centuries, this had been prophesied many times in different cultures, in different generations, that it was just a fact, it was definitely going to happen. And not only that, yes, it would happen because spirit guides and alien beings and so on would make it happen. And it would happen because whether it be weather events or something would happen, it would just wipe out a lot of people. Yes, but... We also felt it was also partly our responsibility too, and therefore we were always encouraged to basically, wherever you were at in your life, whether you were still at school or college or whatever your profession was, that you bring this message to other people. You encourage people to get into meditation, to get into yoga, to start contacting spirits, to open their chakras to higher realms and all of that. Now, not that you would necessarily run it out there and tell them Lucifer is God, that isn't the way to go about it, but to introduce them by any of these spiritualities under that Luciferian umbrella. Once a person gets into the New Age and, and gets involved in these things, they eventually find out themselves the teaching about Lucifer, and by then they're already hooked. Might be a little shock at first, but they just believe it. Because I did, you know, when you're told by your leaders who are mediums that it's okay, Lucifer is an angel of light. He's not Satan. The Bible's wrong. Well, you believe it, especially when you have these spirits turning up that are confirming it. Now, if you have a so-called spirit saying it's a spirit guide or saying it's your dead gran, and it even tells you this is true, then you will believe it because you just assume, well, here's a, a spirit being telling me it's true. It must be true then. Um, of course, what people don't realize is that these spirits do tell lies about Jesus. So it was an agenda, and we were taught to do that in a sense of we were encouraged to do that, infiltrate any realm of society that we were in to bring forth this message. Now, remember, we were thinking this was a good thing. 
we weren't doing it like others who are in darker forms of Luciferianism who were doing it and they knew it was evil. We did it thinking this was a really good thing to encourage society. And of course, 20 years later, I'm really seeing that in a big way now, just watching it happen worldwide. It's definitely mushroomed since those days when I was involved in it. Yeah, and from your perspective, and my perspective as well, um, they tell lies that they're actually guiding dead relatives to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time, you did actually believe that these mediums were channeling people who you knew, but you don't believe that anymore, do you? No, basically because my mother and I began to hear through the grapevine that often mediums would get attacked by spirits we used to read literature, you know, even books by mediums written decades before. And this could be a phenomenon that would happen. Um, and of course, it was explained away by saying, well, it's a hazard of the job. You are contacting the spirit world after all. Of course, you're going to get some nasty spirits coming through. Or if someone claimed that their actual spirit guide had attacked them or their actual dead relatives had attacked them, um, the explanation given would be, well, it's it's just because it's where you're at in your spiritual walk and um, there's some lessons you need to learn and they're just testing you to see how loyal you are to them and, and this type of thing. Or they would even say, well, you've got some bad karma, so you've attracted some low-level spirits. There was always a kind of an explanation given for why this happened. Mm. But, you know, we heard of, of mediums who would end up in psychiatric hospitals because of this and sadly, that began to happen to us. The so-called spirit guides began to attack my mother and I, the so-called dead relatives. My mother, it was worse for her because she was more involved. As I say, I was at school yeah. and I wasn't as dedicated as her. Well, why, why did they do that? I mean, it seems curious that they would, would do that if you were mm -hmm. quite comfortable in the spiritualist church, doing all the things that you were taught and uh, just rolling along. So why would they attack you? Because that would be to put you off, wouldn't it? And put you on a, another path towards a different spirituality. Why would they do that? Mm -hmm. I suspect it's because they knew we were, in a sense, losing a certain amount of interest. Uh -huh. And certainly since heard, this is common for people... Yeah, exactly. If, you, if you're going along with it all and, and uh, doing what they want, then they're not going to create a fuss. They're going to keep up their nice persona. But if you start to show an interest in other things or draw away from them, that is often when they do attack. Because, yeah, you know, worldwide people sometimes contact me and say, I've never had any problem like that from my spirit guide. And I'll say to them, well, that's because you're you're doing what they want you to do. Right. start to turn away from it and, and you will see that they probably will attack and people have got back to me and said yes that's happened um, and also just because I, I guess they're just evil and sometimes just can't right. resist it yeah. but you know yeah. there's you know there's even famous mediums like it was either Doris Stokes or Doris Collins I can't remember which back in the 80s 90s she did write in one of her books that her spirit guide sometimes attacks and threw her across the room and she just kind of accepted it. So <laughs> peculiar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at what point in this story here? I mean, you had a Catholic friend at one point who was giving you a warning, mm -hmm. saying this really is not the thing to be involved with. Although I get the impression that you thought it was a bit of a, a vague warning, but nevertheless, it was a warning. Did that? Do you think trigger any of these attacks at all? I think so. Plus, at high school, we were given the Gideon's Bible. Uh -huh. And I was curious in, it, in anything and, and I thought, you know, I'd never read it before, I should probably read it. And I did actually say the prayer of salvation, the sinner's prayer. I remember that, um, although I didn't know how to follow up having a relationship with Jesus, but I did say the prayer. And I think that really uh, annoyed the spirits and wanted them to put me off following Jesus. Yes, they don't want you to find out who Jesus really is. Of course, that makes complete sense, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so your mother was very badly affected, very, very badly affected by these spirits. In your mm -hmm. article that you wrote for Premier, you say that your mother was thrown about, you went shopping, and you literally saw her being picked up and thrown onto the bonnet of a car. Now, that's when I read that, you know, I think that is absolutely extraordinary. And I want to ask you, is that something that you you believe is an event that happened in the sense that she was actually picked up? Or is this something that affected her mind so that she sort of ran out into the road? I mean, how do you understand what happened? Oh, she was actually picked up because we also had things happen in the house. 
furniture moving and, and things being thrown that weren't our imagination. And, you know, I knew of that happening to other people back in the day that were involved in these things. And, and since then, you know, that's been 20 years ago. Since then, as a Christian in the last 20 years, I've witnessed it in homes where I've went to help people who are bothered by these things. And, yeah, you know, things can move about and all that. So it's not just imagination. It, the demons do have power like that. And this is something that comes along with a, a deep involvement in this kind of thing, would you say? Well, yes and no. Some people can be afflicted by these things and they haven't actually opened any spiritual doors themselves, but it's because their parents or their grandparents were involved in some type of spirituality, some type of occult practice that they have actually inherited it, just like the Bible does say does happen. And at one point she was put in a situation where she was unconscious and mm -hmm. your whole kitchen went up in flames. That must have been terrifying when that happened. Yeah, because normally she would choose when to go into trance, when to channel spirits, thinking, of course, that we were in control of this all along. But see, you're not really in control of it at all. It's all a, a con. Yeah. They are in control once you allow them into your life. So, And they begin to exercise that control more and more. Um, so they would urge her to go into trance, they would urge her to meditate. And sometimes she'd just be too busy and say, you know, I can't, I'll do it later. But they didn't like that, and basically they began to force her into trance against her will. Gosh. So she was not aware at all that the whole kitchen was consumed by fire. And she was um, admitted to a psychiatric ward, um, eventually, was she not? Was, do you, was mm -hmm. that partly because of the... The voices, she had many, many voices coming into her head which she couldn't control and some of those I believe were commanding her to commit murder, is that right? Yeah, so she went to the doctor and asked for sleeping pills uh -huh. and of course she also explained to the doctor she was a medium, that these spirits were getting out of control, she mentioned the, the, the fire in the kitchen, she mentioned the incident with the traffic and basically the medium, sorry, the doctor said there's no such thing as mediums or spirits. Mm. Um, if you feel you're hearing voices and if you're having these dangerous accidents, then you have become a danger to yourself and others and I believe you're schizophrenic. Right. And therefore she admitted her to the hospital, yeah. Was she actually commanded by these voices to kill people? Is that right? Well, yeah, but, you know, she didn't want to do it, obviously. No, no, no. I no, think that no. was when it was getting to the stage where they really knew they were losing their grip of her because she didn't want to we'd left the spiritualist yeah. church by now she didn't want to do meditation or yoga or any of the things they wanted her to do and they were just beginning to show their true colors and just really try and mess with her mind so she was exhausted and she was very frightened as well and it was a shock obviously when she went to the psychiatric hospital but remember we had heard of this before we knew of other channelers and mediums and so on who sometimes ended up in this situation so Although it was a personal shock to us, it wasn't new information. I'm going to be asking you about your conversion, of course, to Christ. Um, I'll ask you that in a minute, but I just want to clarify how the story unfolds here. Because were you a Christian at this point when your mother went into the psychiatric ward? Um, I was. Um, uh -huh. Oh, no, I wasn't. Hold on to think. No, I wasn't when she was... Um, She'd been there maybe about a month, I think, when I then became a Christian. Ah, I see. Okay. I'm trying to see if this is right. It was 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. To remember. Yeah. Um, now, I'm just trying to get the... Please hmm. do continue to think about it. I'm just trying to get the picture straight in my mind. Uh, because in one of your presentations, you say that you and your mum... Oh, I was a Christian. I was. I'm remembering now. I remember it now. Uh-huh. I was. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So it must have been before this time, then, that you and your mum went to the library to do some research on gods and... Mm -hmm. goddesses and entities and that sort of thing who you thought might be able to help you out so this would be before this happened to your mum but obviously things were getting really bad yeah things were getting worse um, so that you were seeking help but I presume none of that was was any help at all well interestingly no it wasn't any help and in fact it did get worse because when you're calling on various gods mm. you're basically invoking th those spirits to you so it just comes along and adds to the mess mm. until one night she couldn't take it any longer and, and she called out to any higher being, any ascended master that she'd not known before. She called out to the highest power 
the very highest power to come and help her and save her from this distress. And uh, an angel came into the room, a beautiful angel, and um, she saw him from across the room and she instantly knew that he was Lucifer. She instantly knew and he approached, this angel approached the bed, but once he came up close to her, she suddenly realised he was the most evil being and he just exuded a real evil presence and he wanted to kill her. And she knew in that moment that Lucifer was not this wonderful angel that uh, we were taught. And she actually started to shout on the name of Jesus Christ. And she shouted it until this being left. Uh Now, I don't know if that really was Lucifer as such, but I think that even if it was a a demonic Mm. angel representing him, it certainly had evil motives and it was the name of Jesus Christ that made it leave. Yeah, now why did she do that? Where did she get that information from, to know to actually do that? Well, very interesting, because I did ask her myself. I think, as a child, she had went to Sunday school, and obviously in primary school as well, they were taught the gospel. So, I guess, when we were calling out on all these different gods from the encyclopedia and so on, Jesus was the one we missed out. I think we just kind of... A, we were inoculated against Christianity, I suppose, because any Christian churches we saw, we felt were dead and boring and not really spiritual. So it was almost as if we tried every God except for Jesus Christ to help us. Um, she still hadn't asked Jesus into her heart at this point, but, but she certainly um, saw the power in using his name to be free from this demon. Yes, yes. Did she ever make a confession of faith in Jesus? Yes, uh, what happened was I asked her along to the, the Christian church that, well, I, I asked Jesus into my heart first of all. A friend invited me to a Christian church. I went along. The atmosphere was so beautiful and I just knew there's something different about this, different from any so-called Christian church I'd been to, probably just because the ones I'd been to weren't really Christian. This one, there was something different and I just knew there was a presence there that was beautiful and that I hadn't felt before. So that got my interest. So that night I went home and the spirits were furious I had been there and basically attacked me and I just sensed that they wanted to kill me. I really did. So I prayed and I asked God if this was true, if Jesus really is the saviour, to help me and to show me the truth. The very next day, a medium turned up at my door. She called herself a Romany gypsy and she used to come round the doors once in a while and sell trinkets and so on and tell your fortune she said to me I'm no longer psychic all those demonic abilities are gone Um, I'm born again I'm walking with Jesus Christ as my saviour and he told me to visit you today and tell you that you are now on the right path right wow I say Mm -hmm. so you were in this new position of faith when did you actually make a commitment was it nearby in time yeah, it was, it was pretty shortly after that, a, a day or so after that. And of course, my Christian friend was delighted and I told her and she invited me to start going there. I started going. My mother was, of course, allowed out of the hospital at the weekend. So I took her there every Sunday. Uh-huh. She wasn't too pleased at first because she still had those Luciferian ideas, even though she'd come away from it all. Um, she still felt Jesus wasn't really the saviour. But she did actually um one day it just all clicked for her and she did ask jesus into her life Uh and very quickly she started to improve in in the sense of the the psychiatrist felt that she was improving and they released her to go back home now that sounded wonderful at the time but unfortunately those demons were still attacking her so we told the pastor, and he was just a young pastor, it was just a new church, he wasn't aware of the deliverance ministry, and even although Jesus and the disciples and apostles cast out demons quite regularly, I guess he just thought that isn't really relevant for today, and um, if Laura and her mother think they're being attacked by demons, they are just mentally ill. In fact, my pastor actually said I should go into the mental hospital too. But my husband, he knew it's not Laura's health. He knew these things were really demonic. Uh, It wasn't just her imagination. However, really, my mother was at the end of her tether because she'd been suffering this for some time. And tragically, she actually committed suicide. Oh, I see. Mm. So presumably they were, I suppose, 
the spirit's attitude towards this must have been, well, we've lost her. She's of no use to us anymore, I suppose. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, and that that was absolutely horrendous mm. for me and the family. Uh, but it's exactly the same story I hear again and again and again over the last 20 plus years from people worldwide who have been in the exact same position or they're in that position right now. I'm even in contact with a woman through Facebook who is through that position right now. She's come out of all of that stuff. She's asked Jesus into her heart and the demons are not leaving her alone. And I've recommended her, you know, to find deliverance ministers who will be able to set her free in in Jesus' name. And it's so sad that the majority of the church kind of thinks demons aren't real or, I don't know, they think it's maybe just a very rare occurrence somewhere in the depths of Africa with voodoo witch doctors, but it's yes. it's very, very common. Um, and my story is not unique at all. You know, people often say to me, what a powerful testimony, Laura, but I almost shake my head because people don't realise this is going on everywhere. Very, very common indeed. Yeah, we've had interviews with uh, Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett, a couple of interviews, and he did research in Madagascar looking at animism and how those people are, through that animism, affected by spirits. And, Mm -hmm. you know, he's reflected upon that at great length and realises how much of that connects to what's going on in the West. Obviously, from his perspective, he's talking about the United States. But to what an extent animism is still alive and kicking in the West is quite an eye-opener. And, uh, you know, we do really need uh, this kind of exorcist mm-hmm. ministry to be taking place in the modern church and i think we we do mm-hmm. need to get beyond this rather modernistic attitude i think that these things are not real and, and get back to the teaching of the new testament and uh, take jesus and the disciples as our model on this i think it's extremely important totally because yeah. what ends up happening is people if they go to christian churches and find no help or, or find the Christians shaking their head in disbelief these people will go elsewhere for help they will contact shamans they will contact mediums they will contact witches uh, to try and get rid of the spirits and of course what's happening then is the demons will pretend to leave but they haven't really left in fact the person will even get more spirits because they've now consulted someone else who is dealing with the spiritual realm Yes, yes, it's the responsibility of the church to take up that. Again, it really is where it is, in fact, not already happening. And I have to say, you know, in my own church, Methodist church, that sort of thing is... Well, I don't know whether it happens... I suppose it does happen in some ways, but it's so quiet that you never hear about it. And I think that's a mistake, because there are people who Mm -hmm. would benefit from that ministry who, are, as you say, are not going to benefit from it, are going to be looking elsewhere and being put in greater danger as a consequence of that. Now, what are the things that you experienced early in your Christian conversion was a different way of looking at the Bible. You had a Bible, I understand, that you were about to throw out, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. there were various verses that popped out at you in a way that hadn't done before. Um, You mentioned Deuteronomy and 2 Corinthians. Could you tell us about why those were so important for you? Yeah, well, I'd had a Bible, I presume it was the Gideon Bible I got from school, and hadn't read it, or if I had, I'd only dipped into it, didn't understand it kind of a put it aside but there was that part of me that thought there's truth in all religions so there's maybe some validity in it something valid so yeah the night before the gypsy came i did pick up the bible and ask if jesus really was god um a scripture did jump out at me and it was all about spiritualism and it was in the old testament i was utterly shocked because i had no idea about this and uh, that kind of jolted me but yeah in the coming days and weeks more scriptures came yeah the one about satan masquerades as if an angel of light indeed i have it here is this the one second corinthians mm-hmm. chapter 11 yeah. 13 to 15 yeah. paul of course is writing to the churches at corinth and um talking about false teachers and things and so he says false apostles deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostle of christ that's the sentence you know it's the end of the sentence and then he carries on and no wonder for even satan disguises himself as an angel of light so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So that's where that little quote comes from. So that really rung with you, did it, that Satan himself actually appears to be good and hides his true nature? Absolutely, and of course that would remind me of when my mother was nearly killed by this angel who claimed to be Lucifer, and yet he was beautiful, he was an angel of light, absolutely, the whole room lit up with light, and yet he was evil. So these so-called angels of light, beings of light, whether they claim to be a dead relative, whether they claim to be a spirit guide or whatever, 
they're actually demons that can morph their form. They can shape shift, as it were. They can change their look. Um, they can impersonate anyone. And, you know, that also makes sense when you look at it from the whole notion of ghosts. Because the Bible says when someone dies, you know, they either go to heaven or hell. That there is no trapped earthbound spirits. The whole notion of ghosts is a demonic counterfeit. And again, that can be tested. People who think that they are talking to ghosts have contacted me from worldwide, different mediums and so on. And they've said they always thought these were true ghosts. But the next time this being turned up, they challenged it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to show its true colours and it would morph into a horrible demon and they would realise, hey, this was not a ghost after all. And as I was saying to Frank Johnson a few weeks ago, because you heard that interview, um, we were talking about ancient aliens and one of the things that he reminded me of was the fact that these spirits can appear to anybody in any way they want according to what that person expects. So Mm -hmm. there may well be cases where people think they're experiencing UFOs, but it could actually be demons messing around with with their expectations. And Mm -hmm. they could appear as fairies, they could appear as Buddhas, they could appear as anything. Absolutely. And, you know, they know what what a person's interested in, so they will appeal to that interest. And, yeah, there has been exactly that um, as well, where people have told me that so-called alien or the so-called fairy or whatever it was, when they challenged it in Jesus' name, it showed its true demonic form. So, yep, there is lots of evidence here yeah. that this is a counterfeit and it, it is deceiving so many people worldwide. But you're out of that now in the sense of actually being involved in it yourself. But, of course, that experience has given you this ministry now in Christian context. So presumably that desire that you have to minister is something that absorbs a great deal of your time. Um how much of your life is taken up with that new ministry? Good question. It's uh, every single day. I work from home, obviously, and um, a lot of the work, if I'm not actually speaking somewhere or doing a radio show like this, it will be emailing folks or people maybe contact me through YouTube or Facebook. And, and many of the folks actually get back to me years later and say, praise God, there's been a domino effect. They are now free And they are now in the deliverance ministry and helping others. And that really absolutely thrills me to bits to hear that, because the more, the better, quite frankly. Yes. And those are many of the people you interview on your own podcast. Yeah, the the people that interview on my broadcast, a few of them actually came out of New Age or, or the occult in recent years through watching me on TV. And then they got to know me and and they've been on my show. And that is just (laughs) almost like a dream come true to see them come full circle and to see them really loving the Lord Jesus and really living a godly life and uh, ministering to others. It's just, it's lovely. Mm. Now, going back to your conversion experience, how sudden was that? I mean, in the sense of being taken out of this world of the occult and finding your life uh, renewed and invigorated Mm -hmm. Jesus. How sudden was that? Did you find that all your problems suddenly disappeared or was there a bit of a journey within that? Oh boy, no, there was certainly a journey. Um, Things were were, were wonderful at at first Mm. and then a couple of months later, I got saved at Easter time. My mother died in August. So yeah, basically a few months later, my mother killed herself and the spirits had been attacking me again. They'd stopped it for a while and then it had started up again. And, of course, this was such a shock. And as I say, when I spoke to my pastor, he just thought I was mentally ill like my mother and he wanted me to go into psychiatric hospital. But my husband knew this really was demonic activity. So I left that church to look for a new church. And it actually took quite a while because all the Christian churches I looked at, none of them really believed me or they couldn't really help. And so it was a bit of a wild goose chase And that was a really horrible time because the demons were, basically they were trying to do what they did to my mother. They were trying to attack me so much that I would just kill myself. And I can tell you when you're in that situation and there's no one who knows how to cast the demons out you, you kind of do feel that way because you feel like you're losing all hope. I couldn't go out the house because of it. You know, I couldn't really go anywhere because of it. Um, But eventually, thank God, I actually turned on the radio one day. It was Revival Radio, a Scottish Christian station. And I heard an elderly gentleman who was a deliverance minister speaking about it and that he was in a church in Glasgow. So I went there 
and they got me help. They began to cast those demons out and I began to improve. And again, that's a very, very common story for people that have been involved in these things. So it is critical for the church to be a bit more open about these things and, as you say, take the New Testament literally. One thing I wanted to ask you before we close Mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. um, what advice you would give to people who know others who are caught up in the occult, perhaps people who have family members who are caught up in that scene as well, because it's very tempting for people to be rather judgmental in those contexts, you know, perhaps say harsh words, which I suspect would not be very helpful. So Mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give to people who have loved ones in that situation? Yes, I've noticed it can vary on the individual person what you can say to them, but I think really there's nothing like sharing a testimony of someone who has been involved in the same type of thing they are, but then, like myself, began to get attacked by spirits and who tried to get free from various people, whether it was other mediums and so on, but just couldn't, and it was at the name of Jesus Christ that they got free. Yeah, it can be difficult talking to folks at first because they they don't want to know at first. Naturally, I I was the same. But testimonies of ex-mediums, ex-psychics, ex-witches can be very helpful for them just to begin to slowly open up to the possibility that that this is a deception and that it is actually Jesus Christ really is the saviour, that he can give basically all, all of the direction that they feel they're getting from these other sources Jesus, the Holy Spirit can direct you. He is a pure God. He is love. He is light. Yes. It's not coming from a, a dangerous, evil spirit. Yes, he is the creator of all things. Um, mm-hmm. Well, thank you ever so much, Laura, for coming on the show. It's obviously not an easy testimony to listen to because it's quite dark, obviously, in, in many aspects. And yet there is that mm-hmm. door that opened up to true light in Jesus Christ after you'd experienced those horrible things. And I think that's a very good thing for us to hear because, um, you know, there may be people listening who do mm-hmm. know people who are caught up in this. And just to hear your, it's like you were saying, a testimony is very, very important. So mm-hmm. it's important for all of us to realize that no matter how dark things can seem, Jesus is there and he can free people in the most dramatic ways from the very darkest places in life. Um, so I do thank you very much for joining us and sharing some you know, very, very personal things with us. I'm grateful to you for doing that. Now, your your ministry is centered in our spiritual quest. Is it dot com? Is that where people would find you? Yeah. 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 But you have a YouTube as well. Is that um, mm-hmm. is that also called our spiritual quest? Um, that's actually called Laura Maxwell X Spirit. It was meant to be X Spiritist, but it didn't want all those letters. So oh, Laura Maxwell X Spirit. <laughs> okay. Um, and how can people find Eternal Radio? Yeah, Eternal Radio have their own website, and that is eternalradio.org.uk. And people can hear it on iTunes as well. I see. So you are one of the shows on that network. Is that how that works? Yeah, I've got one of the shows. There's other hosts as well that have a variety of shows too. Right. Well, of course, I will link to those various things in the notes. Now, would people be able to contact you if they have questions, if they have people they're concerned about? And if so, what would be the best way of getting in contact with you? Yes, there, there is my blog that we mentioned, our spiritualquest.com, and there is the YouTube channel. In actual fact, most people tend to contact me through Facebook. Ah. Maybe it's just easier for people. I don't know why, but that tends to be the most common route. On Facebook, I'll put that link as well. So is that a personal Facebook page or is that one that's linked to your uh, spiritual quest? I have a personal Facebook page, which is Laura Maxwell, but I also have a ministry Facebook page and that is called A Spiritual Quest. Okay, right. Well, I'll link to all those things. And uh, so, you know, if people do have concerns, then uh, they may take that opportunity to contact you. Thank you very much for doing that and being available for people. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a delight to speak to you. And you, Julian. 
So many thanks to Laura for coming on TMR. I hope you enjoyed that and got something from her. I think quite remarkable testimony. If you're interested in a more academic discussion on the issue of evil spirits and spiritual oppression, etc., do check out the TMR interviews that I mentioned with Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett. Obviously, this interview today with Laura just wasn't that kind of thing. It was essentially her testimony, her life experience. But if you are interested in the more academic angle, there is TMR 101. One interesting number there, uh, where Dr. Bennett talks about his field work in Madagascar, looking at how animism affects the population there, and how the Christian ministry of exorcism is practiced in that context. And a follow-up interview, TMR 146, in which he discusses the situation in the West and the importance of the deliverance ministry in the Western context. So both of those are recommended, complementing, I think, rather well what we've heard today from Laura Maxwell. And in case any of you happen to be wondering, the clip with Dr. Stanley Monteith was from TMR number 11, so way back from 2013. And I'm also going to take the opportunity to repeat something that I said a couple of shows back because I am fully aware that not everybody listens to every single podcast that comes out, so people sometimes miss announcements that I make. And by the way, that's fine by me. That's part of the way TMR is designed to work. Some things will interest person A, but they won't interest person B. Other things will interest person B, but not person A. But perhaps sometimes people will end up listening to something that they never thought that they would do. So that's part of the philosophy here. But as a consequence, announcements sometimes need repeating. So that's what I'm going to do. Quite a lot of you will recall that I said a few months back I wasn't quite sure how much time I was going to have for podcasting in the near future due to the arrival of our new baby on the scene. Um, I said the podcast might have to become a fortnightly thing instead of the almost weekly pattern that I had tried to stick to in earlier days of the show. So I'm making this official now. Until he grows up a bit more, I do not have time at the moment to produce these weekly. So TMR is officially... Until further notice, anyway, it's officially a fortnightly podcast. And God willing, it shall get back to the original pattern in due course. I will also say that I have been encouraged by the several donations that have come into TMR. Thank you very much indeed to those of you who have shown your support in that way. That is a huge blessing, actually, because it gives me at least the hope that I shall not have to go on shouldering all the costs, all the running costs here, in addition to the many hours that I put into these productions. So thank you very much for your support, those of you who've done that. So once again, if you value this ministry, you wish to see it continue, and you are in a position to make even a very small donation, then please do consider doing that. Um, and you can do that at themindrenewed.com forward slash support. Next time... Uh, so that's, of course, in a fortnight from now, I should be having another conversation with the lawyer and lecturer, Adi Yinka Mackinday. Our previous conversation was to do with his academic paper, Can the British State Convict Itself? And we talked about Tony Blair and the troubles in Northern Ireland and the so-called extraordinary renditions of the War on Terror. Uh, this time we shall discuss his article, The Pan-Islamic Option, The West's Part in the Creation and Sustaining of Islamist terror. And then after that, we should be joined again by some of the band members of Dissident Prophet, the superb Christian indie rock band uh, who've been featured on TMR a couple of times before. This time, I think it's going to be Andy and Mel who will be coming on, and they'll be talking about their new album and playing some of the music from it, of course. I don't even know what it's called yet, by the way. Not even heard any of the music, but uh, I have such confidence in their creativity that I'm absolutely sure that it's going to be wonderful, as always, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, some of those tracks, or indeed all of those tracks, in the next couple of weeks. After that, not sure yet. As usual, there are a few things in the pipeline, and I shall let you know as any of those get the green light, which you can find out about by periodically checking the schedule page, which I do update from time to time between nappy changes. Uh, that's themindrenew.com forward slash schedule. Uh, finally, if you are enjoying TMR, let me say it hasn't had many likes and comments on iTunes for quite a while now. But if you do use iTunes and you are enjoying the show, then please do spend a moment to give a good review and high rating there. That would be very helpful indeed and very encouraging. So that's it for today. Again, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Laura Maxwell. Don't forget to check out the show notes. Um, so I'll be speaking to you again, hopefully, in about a fortnight from now. You have been listening to me, Julian Charles, of themindrenewed.com, and I very much look forward to speaking to you again in the near future.